I also just wanted to say how proud I am that we've given away four um, graduate student scholarships. And if you were able to join the June meeting, you heard the first second. And tonight we're super excited for our um, other two recipients, Ayam and Nisha. And um, each of them um, will do a presentation tonight and then write a short article for our newsletter. So it's, it's really fun to see what's going on at the, um, at the higher education levels. Um, so tonight, I am, I believe you're going first and um, she's gonna present competitive success of Fomatopsis betulina as a wood degrading fungus. And I am is originally from Kazakhstan and she graduated from McAllister College in May of 2022. Um, at McAllister, she majored in biology and philosophy and minored in German studies. She joined the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology at the University of Minnesota as a PhD student in fall of 2022. Um, and she works in Jonathan Schilling's lab studying wood degrading fungi and is interested in both the ecological implications and the industrial applications of uh, fungal wood decaying mechanisms. Uh, her other passions are philosophy and German studies. And I would ask that if people have questions that they put them in the chat and I'll make sure they get um, relayed to I am after the presentation. And then I am when you're done, um, Nisha, I will present your topic and your, your bio. So thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm very glad to be here. Um, so I will be talking about my current project, competitive success of Phomatopsis betulina as a wood degrading fungus. First of all, I'd like everyone to appreciate how many trees there are on this photo, and I've included it to help us wrap our, uh, wrap our brains around this astonishing number, 3.04 trillion trees on earth. And uh, with approximately seven and a half billion people, that's around 400 trees per person. So there are 1.3 trillion trees in tropical and subtropical forests, 0 0.66 trillion trees in temperate forests, and 0 0.74 trillion trees in boreal forests. A good portion of Earth's surface is covered by trees, and it's um, pretty easy to see how all of these trees play a role in the carbon cycle through photosynthesis, respiration, um, below ground carbon allocation when they're alive. But when they die, they're still continuing to participate in the carbon cycle in a more passive way. So they're degraded by a handful of different organisms, but the process is worldwide dominated by the fungi. The fungi metabolize some of the carbon for energy and also use it to create their fungal biomass. And of course, a lot of it is respired CO2 and the remaining carbon stays in the ground and then contributes to the soil organic matter pool. And then eventually the fungi die and also become part of the soil organic matter. And these fungi are among very few organisms on earth that are able to degrade our 3 trillion trees once they die. And without them, the carbon cycle wouldn't be a cycle and it would look substantially differently. Fungi are skilled plant biomass degraders and they sustainably make energy by utilizing plant biomass and they gained this ability around 295 million years ago. And humans would also like to be able to, um, to uh, sustainably make energy from plant biomass. So wood decay fungi have a lot of potential in biotechnology. So both the potential applications in biotechnology and the um, underlying implications um, in the carbon cycle rely on our complete understanding of wood decay fungi mechanisms. So uh, understanding how these fungi are able to degrade the wood. And so I'll get into some of that biochemistry next. So if you look at this cross-section here 
of the cross section of the tree. And then you zoom in, you will be able to see the cells of the wood. Uh, and you see they're kind of like tubes and they're called, those structures are called secondary xylem. And it runs along the length of the tree and the primary function of it is to transport water. And then when you look at the cell walls of the secondary xylem, you see that um, there is a primary cell wall and a secondary cell wall. The secondary cell wall is comprised of three main polymers. There is hemicellulose, there's cellulose, and there is lignin. The first two, the hemicellulose and the cellulose, are carbohydrates. Uh, so cellulose here in the middle is uh, a long chain of glucose monomers. Hemicellulose is also a chain of very different hexoses and pentoses. And lignin is quite different. Lignin is this amorphous polymer. It's made of these units uh, that are called phenylpropanoid units. It's just very different from these two that are sh sugars, they're carbohydrates. So uh, here on this model, you can see that these three polymers, the hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin are intertwined in a sort of matrix. And um, you see that uh, cellulose is in blue and that's what provides the mechanical strength and the lignin in green is acting as the glue. And depending on the plant species, these components are gonna be found in different um, amounts. Uh, and the, again, the idea is that these structures provide support and strength for the plants. And these structures are what is so delectable to wood decaying fungi. And there are many types of uh, wood decaying fungi, but I'm going to focus on the two main broad categories, the brown rod fungi and the white rod fungi. These fungi interact with the cell wall components, the cellulose, hemicellulose, and the lignin in very different ways. And here on this graph, I think it's nicely displayed. So the brown rod fungi do not eat as much lignin. They leave most of the lignin behind and instead selectively go for the carbohydrates, the cellulose and the hemicellulose. And you can see here on this graph, the rate is higher. The rate of consumption of hemicellulose and cellulose is higher for brown rod. On the other hand, for the white rods, they are going for the lignin first, they selectively delignify the wood and then consume the hemicellulose and the cellulose. And this here, uh, these two images are the um, two images of deconstruction patterns that result in different wood residue appearances. So uh, the brown rot fungus will leave behind these kind of um, brown cubic checked pattern and uh, the white rod fungi will leave the white stringy residue. So um, the brown rots use reactive oxygen species system that selectively extracts carbohydrates. So again, they're going for these sugars. That's what they want. That's what's tasty. The lignin is left behind. It's not really worth it. It's hard to break down. Um, so they have devised ways to go around it. The white rod fungi are the ones that, are, uh, that have evolved first they use the oxidative enzymes to first remove the lignin and then via that route to release the carbohydrates and consume those. So white rod fungi are using this enzymatic system of peroxidases and carbohydrate active enzymes. They're using a lot of enzymes that are very specific to break down the cell wall. There is some variation depending on the timing of these enzymes. There's some simultaneous white rotters that will use all of these enzymes at the same time, and they will remove all the components, the lignin, the hemicellulose, the cellulose, at a fairly equal rate. And there's some that are selective white rot fungi. So they're selectively going for the lignin first. The white, uh, sorry, the brown rot fungi have a very different system. They have two main steps. Oxidative step is the one that relies on this Fenton reaction here. And that is generating this um, uh, hydroxyl radical. And the second, so the hydroxyl radical is loosening the cell wall structure. 
Then the second step is the hydrolytic step. And this is where they secrete their very limited suite of posies, their carbohydrate active enzymes. So they have much less enzymes. They're, um, they're, the number of the enzymes, the different types of enzymes is smaller, but they don't need that many because they're mostly relying on these um, hydroxyl radicals to loosen the cell wall structure. And then the couple of enzymes that they do have are then degrading the carbohydrates. So now that we kind of understand the differences roughly in white rot and brown rot wood decay mechanisms, let's focus on what that means for the implications for the carbon cycle. So the above ground biotic carbon on earth is around 575 kilograms. There is, oops, sorry, there is 450 petagrams in wood, and of that, 270 petagrams are in wood carbohydrates, whereas 180 of petagrams of carbon are in wood lignin. So again, 180 petagrams of carbon are in lignin. There are only 575 petagrams on earth to begin with. So that's a lot of carbon at stake. So if the white root fungus, that is again, lignin degrading, if this fungus dominates the wood decaying process, then we are not left with a lot of lignin. Most of it is decayed. Only 5% remains, and that's only nine petagrams. On the other hand, if the brown rod fungus that is carbohydrate selective, so it goes for the carbohydrates, for the sugars, and leaves most of the lignin behind, we are left with 90%, 162 petagrams. That's the big difference. And the Schilling lab, uh, the lab that I'm part of, and uh, the colleagues have researched the competitive success of brown rods and white rods, and they have looked at how changing the environment affects who dominates the wood decaying process. So there are two papers, Klein et al. and Song et al., that have looked at Betula papyrifera, so the birch, paper birch, um, and they, uh, the first study, Klein et al., is a field study. The second one, Song et al., is in the lab, in a microcosm. And so the results for them were such that Klein et al., the field study, showed 100% white rod dominance. So in all of their trials, the white rod dominated the wood decaying process. For the lab um, field, uh, sorry, the lab experiment, 100% were brown rot outcome. So this is interesting because there's such a difference in field versus microcosms. But also what's more important is that we never see Fomatopsis betulina, the fungus that I focus on, in our field experiments. We never see it, but it's everywhere in nature. We see it all the time. So the goal of my project was to establish the conditions under which Fomatopsis betulina succeeds in dominating birch decay. And that's important because birch is a very common tree in the boreal, Earth's largest biome. Fomatopsis betulina is the only very common brown rot fungus that decays birch. If brown rot dominates, then likely more carbon is sequestered into the soil instead of escaping into the atmosphere as uh, CO2. And Phomatopsis betulina's domination in decaying birch is a great model ecosystem, uh, uh, sorry, ecological system um, in which we can test the controls on brown rot success uh, on our planet in the uh, changing climate. So just um, the overview of what my treatment structure looked like. I had eight treatments. There were three variables, soil, log, and inoculum. And the soil was either sterile or live. The log was either sterile or live. And then the inoculum was either added or not. And uh, just a side note, inoculum is a compact mass of mycelium. So a compact mass of Phomatopsis betulinus mycelium. And my specific objectives were to firstly, determine the DNA relative abundances to see which fungal species dominated in each of these treatments. And then also to make sure 
to verify that the dominant fungi also dominated the wood decay type modifications. So to verify that if Pharmatopsis betulinin did in fact, uh, was in fact the most abundant, did it actually result in brown rot outcome? So uh, we would be relying on fungal rot type indicators. Um, so just a very quick overview of how I set up the experiment. Um, what were the steps to um, set it up? First, growing the fungus itself, um, I used the potato dextrous um, agar plates and um, they, the fungi were on those plates for a couple of weeks, then they were transferred onto oat jars. Uh, so you can see a photo here and they were incubated for three weeks and then transferred onto sawdust jars once they looked uh, colonized, um, like on this photo here. And then, so they uh, stayed in sawdust jars for another three weeks. So I waited until they were ready for inoculation. And then at that point, they looked something like this on these photos you see. Uh, and that is uh, what I used to then inoculate the logs. So the birch trees were um, young trees. They, the logs were only 12 centimeter long. I cut them um, short. And on two ends, I made two holes with a drill uh, where the inoculum would go. And so you can see me on this photo, uh, putting the inoculum into the holes. Then I used cheese wax to seal it all up and uh, I placed it in the field. Uh, and this is at Itasca Biological Station in uh, Northern Minnesota. So I placed them there. Um, there was a chicken uh, wire, chicken, fence wire, I think it's called, to keep uh, the animals away. And um, I harvested them a little over a year later in September, 2022. And so once I did harvest them, I saw that every sample that was inoculated with my fungus had at least one sporophore of Homotopsis betulina coming out of it. So that was already huge because we never have, we've never seen Fomatopsis betulina in our field manipulative trials, but we needed to verify that Fomatopsis betulina actually dominated the wood decaying process and that the wood decay outcome was in fact brown rot. So we needed to do a lot more work. So the logs looked like this once I harvested them and I removed 10 centimeters on both ends to kind of remove the, you know, the whole part that contained a lot of inoculum. And then the middle part that I ended up with was divided into two parts. One was used for physical chemical analyses and the other was used for the DNA analyses. And the physical chemical one involved um, a couple of steps. The first one was uh, measuring the density loss. And the second was milling um, the samples uh, using a Wiley mill to generate the sawdust that was fine enough for me to then perform the process of acid hydrolysis. So this process generates um, two main things that I'm interested in. It generates these acid solubilized sugars and the insoluble lignin. So the idea is that polymers of carbohydrates, if you remember the hemicellulose and cellulose, they will be broken down by the acid that I add to the system into monomers that are then quantified by high-performance liquid chromatography. And then that will tell me what exactly the fungi are eating. And that tells me, in a way, after a little bit of analysis, what um, was the outcome of wood decay, brown versus white rot. And then uh, the, this is the insoluble lignin. This is the lignin that did not get solubilized by acid. And um, this is a close-up photo of one of the samples. I uh, measure the mass of the lignin, and that is important again in telling me, um, it tells me if the sample was brown rot versus white rot. And why is that? Because the lignin loss to density loss ratio is a great effective indicator of fungal rot type. So uh, here on this figure, you can see in blue are the white rots and in orange are the brown rot fungi. 
And this line here is at 0 0.8. So lignin loss relative to density loss has been illustrated to be an effective indicator. And in brown rods, less lignin is lost. Just think about it. It makes sense that the, the orange ones, the brown rods are on the left, their lignin loss to density loss ratio is less than 0 0.8 because they have less lignin loss. So the number in the numerator is low while the number in the denominator is high. And that gives you a small number, a number that is less than 0 0.8. On the other hand, on the right are the white rods they have more lignin loss because they are selectively going for the lignin. So both the number in the numerator, the lignin loss, and the number in the denominator, the density loss, are high. So that gives you a large number, a number that is larger than 0 0.8, it's to the right. So again, this threshold is important. Everything that is smaller than 0 0.8 is a brown rod. Everything larger is the white rod. So now moving on to the results, I have a couple of figures to share. Uh, the first one here is um, density loss. So on the y-axis here, you can see density loss in percent. Uh, and here on the x-axis, you can see the log variable. So sterile log on sterile log, sterile log on sterile log. This first panel to the left is sterile soil, it says here. And this panel is on sterile soil. And then two colors, the red or pink is the inoculated and the blue is non-inoculated. So no Fomitopsis betulina was added. And you see there's a stark difference between the red and the blue. The red has um, more density loss than the blue. So inoculation is an important factor in promoting density loss. Importantly, it was the only significant factor that promoted density loss. So in all my analyses, uh, you will see that uh, the soil and the log didn't really have a significant effect on any of my variables. This graph here is very, very similar. The only difference is the y-axis, the lignin to density ratio. It's what we talked about just couple of minutes ago, the lignin loss to density loss ratio. And this is the fungal rot type indicator. This is the threshold line of 0 0.8. So everything below that is brown rot. Everything above is white rot. So the brown rot are in red and the um, white rot are in blue. And that, that is the idea, and uh, it is confirmed here because the inoculated samples are brown rod. So everything I inoculated with Phomatopsis betulina did actually end up being brown rod outcome. The samples that were not inoculated with my fungus ended up being white rod outcome. Uh, these following couple graphs are going to be about the sugars. So they're gonna be very similar. Everything is pretty much the same. The axis that's changing is the Y axis. And here you see glucan remaining. And glucan is basically just the glucose polymer. It's basically glucose. It's just think about it as cellulose, the carbohydrate that I mentioned before, the cellulose. There is less glucan remaining in inoculated samples. You can see here, the red are lower than the blue. So, all the samples that were inoculated, the samples that were brown rot outcome had less sugars remaining, less cellulose. And this is the same idea. I just wanted to have another graph showing you the xylan remaining, which is the hemicellulose. So the other carbohydrate that we talked about. Uh, so a very similar pattern here. But then importantly, the uh, y-axis here is glucan remaining again. And the x-axis is the LTD ratio. So again, is it a brown rod or is it the white rod? And you see that here is the line for 0 0.8 threshold. There is less glucan remaining in samples with brown rod outcome. These points here are lower than these ones here. So there is this preference for carbohydrates for glucan relative to lignin. They are leaving most of the ligand behind. 
and are going for the carbohydrates. And you see a very similar pattern here with xylan, the hemicellulose. There is preference for the carbohydrates relative to lignin. Um, and then just the last big figure, the last figure that I'd like to um, um, show you is the DNA data. So the previous ones were the physical chemical analyses, and this is a little bit different. This is still mostly work in progress. I just wanted to show you this main one where you see uh, that fomatopsis dominated the wood decay process in the treatments that uh, were inoculated. So all the samples that were inoculated with fomatopsis were in fact um, abundant in fomatopsis. You see here on the y-axis is the relative abundance in percent. And uh, this panel here is sterile soil. This panel here is unsterile soil. It says right here. Then if you look at it horizontally, this is sterile log. If you look down here, that's unsterile log. And then um, these columns are inoculated, non-inoculated, inoculated, non-inoculated. Non I hope this makes sense. Um, so you see right away the big orange blocks. And if you look at the legend, that's the genus of Phomatopsis, the fungus that I have inoculated my samples with. So you see that in inoculated samples, the Phomatopsis genus is super prevalent. That's the relative abundance is huge up to um, 85 here and um, maybe a little higher here as well. So um, that's just a big message there. Phomatopsis did actually uh, dominate the wood decay process in these uh, inoculated samples. But as I said, there is still work in progress with the DNA data. I'm still in the process of analyzing the 16S, that's the bacterial community composition, and the ITS2, that's the fungal community composition. Still looking at it all because it's a lot of data, and I'm trying to uh, see what organisms are associating with Phomatopsis betulina, uh, which ones are correlating with the success of Phomatopsis betulina, other associations that are predictive of uh, Phomatopsis betulina success. And also, really quickly, I'd like to mention the follow up project that um, I have set up. I have set up the field study a couple of weeks ago at ITASCA again. Um, and this is roughly the idea. So the project that I just presented to you, in every sample that I inoculated with my fungus, the Phomatopsis vegulina, um, every time I inoculated it, I did see it dominate. I did see the sporophores. I saw the brown rod outcome. So. The question now is how much of inoculum is enough for it to succeed? So the goal for this project, the follow-up project, is to establish that threshold of inoculum potential above which Phomatopsis betulina succeeds in dominating birch. And then to use this threshold to make predictions for Phomatopsis betulina's success based on its presence at the time of tree death. So instead of treating the inoculum variable as a binary, added inoculum versus not added inoculum, I'm treating it as a continuous variable, more or less. I mean, there's still discrete amounts, but there is more within that one variable. And I'm not focusing on the soil or the log anymore because they didn't prove to be significant factors. So I have inoculum potential from uh, zero to 100, 0%, 2%, 20, 40, and so on. So 100% is the amount of inoculum that I had in my first project. Zero means no inoculum at all, just the sterile sawdust. Um, and so the key takeaways for the presentation are as follows. We controlled the outcome and we made it work. So inoculation with Phomatopsis betulina did actually produce brown rod outcome. And this is, this seems kind of okay, that makes sense, but. It hasn't happened before. We never saw this fungus win in any of the manipulative trials before. And we did see the sporophores in every sample that was inoculated with it. And then the patterns, as you saw, lacked noise. They were pretty reliable. There was a lot of supporting evidence uh, because all the samples that were actually inoculated with this fungus did show all hallmarks of brown rot. 
in physical chemical analyses, the lignin loss data showed that it was a brown rod. The sugar loss was also brown rod. Uh, then the DNA data, the ITS2 data, also revealed that Fomatopsis betulina dominated decay process. And there's still, as I mentioned, work in progress to identify who is correlated with Fomatopsis betulina success. What are the other fungi and the bacteria that are also there and perhaps contributing to this fungus's success? And with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people and the funding sources. I'd like to thank Dr. Jonathan Schilling, my advisor, uh, Claire Anderson, the PhD candidate in our lab, Dr. Yan Mei Zhang, the postdoc in our lab. And I'd like to uh, say thank you to you, the Minnesota Mycological Society, for awarding me the James Swanson and Doris Joannes Memorial Graduate Student Scholarship. And the other sources of funding are Itasca Biological Station Tester Fellowship Award and the MinDrive Environment Seed Grant Award. And with that, I am ready to take any questions. Thank you so much. The first question I see in the chat is uh, Randy Strobel, who does a lot of uh, cultivation. And Randy's asking, what is the fate of the lignin after brown rot degradation? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, so as I said, um, if the brown rot uh, fungus dominates the process, most of the lignin is left behind. And the idea is that it is likely getting sequestered into the soil. What does that really mean? Well, it's ending up in the soil. It is probably, of course, going to end up in the carbon cycle at some point. It's going to be degraded. Uh, it's going to uh, it's going to be degraded by other bacteria at a very uh, much lower rate, though. So um, it is not just going to be trapped there, but for our purposes, we're trying to have less CO two potentially escaping at a high rate. Um, for our purposes, it is going to stay in the soil. But again, I'm saying likely because. I think nobody actually really knows that for sure. That's a great, that would be a great experiment to conduct to see, um, and people are probably doing that, uh, but it is just likely getting sequestered into the soil and waiting until bacteria slowly degrade it. Randy, did you have any other follow-ups to that question? Did you want to unmute? Uh, no, no, thanks for the answer. No. Yeah, I had a question just about um, the sterilized logs versus the unsterilized. And, um, you know, I'm guessing that you had live trees so that they haven't already collected a bunch of other um, species. And curious how you sterilize your logs. Yeah, that's a great question, too. So um, the logs usually the trees have endophytes in them, the fungi and the bacteria that are living in it, uh, not causing any harm. Um, there's also obviously while I'm handling all those trees, uh, there's stuff on the surface that um, just, there's just a lot there. Um, so I use the autoclave and I'm not sure if people know what that is. It's basically, oh, this is going to be tough to explain because I myself don't really know exactly the process behind it, but it's this machine that we use in the lab that uh, uses um, high pressure, uh, vapor pressure to um, sterilize and kill everything that's alive. Um, and we use that to sterilize all our equipment and our media and the logs and soils as well. Um, so I don't really know necessarily the process behind it, but that's what I used. And um, that's what people usually use as well. It's this huge machine that does it for you. Yep, great, thank you. Good. Any other questions for Iam? I'm not, I'm not seeing any questions. All right. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. It's really fascinating. A lot of people do do cultivation, so it's very cool to see how you like tested results of things growing and kind of presented to us some of the stuff we're maybe seeing in the woods, but not completely understanding. I believe an autoclave is uh, pretty close to a pressure cooker. Yeah, I think um, our pressure. 
A huge one. <laughs> yeah, R and R has a huge, huge one. Mm -hmm. Very cool. For their cultivation business. All right. So I'm going to um, unpin you, I am, and introduce Dionysia or Anisha. Um, so thank you for thank you for agreeing to go second. I know sometimes it's harder to harder to wait, but we really, really appreciate you both speaking tonight. Um, and Nisha is presenting effects of experimental warming and reduced rainfall on ectomycorrhizal fungi communities at the temperate boreal ecotone. So super, like we are all very interested in um, the global climate change and what will it do to the mushrooms? And this is very cool. Um, and Nisha graduated from Princeton University in 2017 where she studied ecology and evolutionary biology. After college, she worked for two years at the nonprofit Climate Center, where she was primarily engaged in outreach, including in-person presentations to planners, environmental groups, and other stakeholders involved in climate resiliency work. She joined the University of Minnesota in 2020 and is currently a third-year PhD candidate working with Dr. Peter Kennedy and Dr. Peter Reich. So yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks, Kathy, for that intro. Um, so yeah, I work with Dr. Peter Kennedy and Dr. Peter Reich. And um, today I'll be talking about mainly uh, some, some of the results from the first chapter of my dissertation on the effects of warming and reduced rainfall on ectomycorrhizal fungal communities at the temperate boreal ecotone here in Minnesota. One little mushroom. Um, so for an outline, uh, I'll do a brief background of um, the work that I do, the study system, and then I'll talk a bit about my study site and methods, uh, state my research questions, I'll go over some, just a small section of some cool results, and if there is time, um, I'll sort of briefly talk about some other on, ongoing fungal research that I'm doing for my second chapter, uh, and then hopefully we'll have some time for a brief Q&A. Okay, so to start off, why do we, why should we study the effects of climate change on fungi at the temperate boreal ecotonal, uh, at, on fungi in forests at the temperate boreal ecotone? Um, so I didn't really think a lot about the ecotone until I had worked, started working at Minnesota, and then I was just like completely fascinated by it. So we are super close to the region of transition between temperate and boreal forests. So here's a map that I really like. And you can see Minnesota on the left. And so everything in dark green is this sort of transition zone between uh, temperate deciduous forest and the boreal forest. And you can see Duluth up here. The sites that I work, uh, work in are actually in Cloquet and they're sort of just outside Duluth, uh, actually at the Cloquet Forestry Center, which sounds like people were just at. Um, so boreal forests are really important carbon sinks. They are about a third of forest cover. But what's really cool to me about them is that much of this carbon is actually sequestered below ground in soils, uh, including, for example, as permafrost. Um, one study actually found, which is really fascinating, that as much as 50 to 70 percent of below ground carbon can be derived from roots and their associated microorganisms, especially fungi. But these carbon sinks, as we know, are at risk due to warming at these high latitudes. In addition to um, warming leading to permafrost melting, we could see altered soil fungal community composition, which studies have already started to show. And uh, it may also lead to altered fungal community functions, such as faster rates of decomposition, which releases more CO2 from the soil. Uh, and so I wanted to create this cartoon summary to sort of think about, well, what do we already know about the effects of climate change on these temperate boreal ecotonal forests? So we know a good amount about what's going on above ground. Um, so thinking about trees, we've seen evidence of northward migration of temperate trees um, into these north or northward um, boreal communities. And so we're seeing shifts in certain tree communities. We've also observed declines in photosynthesis and growth of boreal tree species with warming. 
uh, and also evidence of shifting phenology. So earlier bud burst in earlier warmer springs. Uh, and we can also see altered above ground forest functions, specifically, for example, changing litter quality and quantity related to these effects of warming and reduced rainfall on uh, tree canopies. And we know this has implications, especially given the talk we just listened to. Uh, this has implications for the below ground decomposers. So below ground, um, we actually know surprisingly less compared to above ground. We have seen evidence of shifts in soil fungal community structure with warming, but the responses to combined stressors like warming and reduced rainfall are less clear and less studied. Which motivates my research. Um, so why should we care about the effects of climate change specifically on tempered boreal ectomycorrhizal fungi? Um, so brief overview, what are ectomycorrhizal fungi? Um, we know that one component of them is their fruiting bodies, which a lot of us have seen and we're all familiar with, um, but also root tips. So ectomycorrhizal fungi colonize the fine roots of trees and they create this mantle that surrounds the fine root. And we get an interface for exchange of carbon from the tree to the fungus and primarily nitrogen from the fungus to the tree. And um, so they are actually very essential for tree nutrition and tree growth. Uh, but ectomycorrhizal fungi also produce this extramatrical mycelium, which they can use to explore surrounding soil and sort of mine nutrients from organic matter. So they actually play a key role in decomposition. So this is really cool because ectomycorrhizal fungi mediate, mediate both above and below ground responses to climate change in these forests. And for my PhD, I'm focusing primarily on um, the root tips and extramatrical mycelium. So when I first started this project, I thought a lot about, well, what frameworks could we use to study the effects of climate change on uh, these ectomycorrhizal communities? And one framework that's super, uh, super popular concept is this concept of environmental filtering, which is literally just simply the exclusion of taxa from habitats due to unsuitable living conditions. Um, and so if we have a regional species pool of a certain group of fungi that looks like this, um, under certain environmental stressors like warming or reduced rainfall or maybe very acidic pH, we could see this literal filtering of the uh, species from that pool. And it could lead to different phenomenon. One uh, is called phylogenetic clustering where we would see uh, species that are actually in high, have higher relatedness compared to what we might expect from the regional species pool. One study um, actually did look at environmental filtering of ectomycorrhizal fungi in Germany along a north to south gradient. Um, they looked at communities in beech and conifer forests and they compared these warm, dry, sandy soil sites where you might expect phylogenetic clustering versus cooler, wet clay soil sites. In the warm, dry, sandy soil sites, they actually, uh, they observed lower taxonomic diversity, um, but they didn't observe evidence of phylogenetic clustering. And in these cool, wet clay soil sites, they observed higher taxonomic diversity, but they actually did see phylogenetic clustering. And so that had me thinking a bit about the conditions of this um, large scale study where we're not only varying the rainfall and the temperature conditions, but we're also varying things like soil texture. And so I wondered how would these patterns hold under experimental settings when we're only manipulating warming and rainfall and keeping other variables pretty much constant. And so that brings me to the, my study site. So my study site is up in Cloquet. Um, I work at the Boreal Forest Warming at an Ecotone in Danger experiment before warmed, run by one of my advisors, Peter Reich, uh, and several other PIs. Um, and before I talk about my research, I just want to acknowledge that the research that I do was conducted at the Cloquet Forestry Center, which is located on the reserved lands of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa on the unceded territory of the Great Lakes Anishinaabe. Um, and so with that, the Before Warmed is a global change experiment that started in 2009 in temperate boreal ecotonal sites in Minnesota, 
Uh, it includes above ground warming. Uh, so you can see on the right, there are these infrared sensors, um, infrared lamps rather. And then below ground, there are these warming cables. There were also rain out enclosures that were installed in 2012. So that allowed for a reduced rainfall treatment. The individual pots are pretty small and um, they're replicated. So you can kind of see this person here. Um, they're quite small, they're circular, they're three meters in diameter. Uh, and there are a mix of native temperate and boreal tree seedlings. Uh, they are one to four years old when the experiment starts and they get harvested about four to five years later. The three temperature treatments that I'm working in are ambient, about 1.7 degrees Celsius and about 3.3 degrees Celsius of warming above ambient. And then the rainfall treatments are about ambient and 30% reduced rainfall. Uh, and this long-term experiment, because of the above and below ground uh, warming aspect, really allows for this concurrent investigation of how climate change is affecting not only the plant community, but also the soil community. Uh, and this is just showing how these six factorial treatments actually lead to this really cool soil moisture gradient that I will be taking advantage of. And so for my research questions that I'll be talking about today, today, um, I'll be asking, how does ectomycorrhizal fungal community structure respond to a gradient of soil moisture in these factorial warming and rainfall treatments at B4 Warmed? And I'll be taking a look at um, the alpha diversity, so like species richness, and then uh, beta diversity, so what fungi are actually there. So for my hypotheses that I am testing, thinking about this framework of uh, the environment, at the before warmed filtering out the fungal community. I anticipate that some fungi uh, will be sensitive to any warming treatments uh, and just won't be found. Others might be sensitive just to the reduced rainfall treatments, some to the uh, most extreme treatments, whereas others will sort of be these warmer, drier specialists. Taking a look specifically at the effects of combined warming and reduced rainfall in this yellow box, I anticipate uh, lower taxonomic diversity in these treatments, given this environmental filtering effect, and also um, evidence from previous studies, uh, specifically one previous study in Alaska um, and one at before worm, suggest uh, potential shifts toward ascomycete fungi. Um, uh, and this has been observed, and so I also anticipated that I would see this at before warmed. So for my methods, uh, I sampled fine roots in 2021 from about two to three seedlings per species per plot. Um, and they were dried and pulverized, and I extracted the DNA from them, and we used aluminum IC high throughput sequencing to figure out what ECM fungal communities were there. I uh, sampled actually two hosts with varying drought tolerance as this is sort of extra interesting component to the study um, to see if the fungal community response also varied by the drought tolerance of their hosts. So we have Pinus banksiana, which will be abbreviated as PINBA, which is not only more drought tolerant, but it's also a more boreal species. So it's a more Northern range. And then Pinus strobus, so uh, is more temperate and is drought intolerant. Um, and there are three plots per factorial combination of warming and rainfall. And this is a, a cool image of, uh, I believe, a, a root tip from a jack pine, so pinba, that I was looking at under the microscope. So, um, so for some of my results. Starting with alpha diversity, uh, ectomycorrhizal fungal alpha diversity did respond to warming and reduced rainfall, but what was really cool was that it actually seemed to differ by the, by the tree host identity. So I took a look at the mean number of ectomycorrhizal fungal OTUs. Um, so that just stands for operational taxonomic unit, which is effectively representing a uh, unique species. Um, on our x-axis, we see temperature and then the uh, color on the left that looks like blue to me is ambient and then on the right the which looks like red to me is reduced rainfall um, and you can see that starting with this first host pinus strobus which is the temperate drought intolerant tree species 
I observed significantly higher OTU richness in the ambient temperature treatment with reduced rainfall compared to the 3.3 um, warming treatment with reduced rainfall treatment. Uh, for Pinus banksiana, what was really interesting was what was going on in this intermediate temperature treatment, this plus 1.7 degrees Celsius, where I actually observed significantly higher OTU richness in the 1.7 degrees Celsius temperature uh, treatment when there was ambient rainfall compared to when rainfall was reduced. So these two had significant differences in richness. But there were also some other interesting findings, though not statistically significant, but that were very um, interesting differences between the two hosts. So Pinus strobus, it seemed like what the most interesting things that were going on were actually occurring in these reduced rainfall treatments, which is interesting as Pinus strobus is actually the drought intolerant host. Um, and in these reduced rainfall treatments, um, they seem to the richness seemed to just decline as temperature increased. And also for the ambient and 1.7 treatments, higher OTU richness was actually observed under reduced rainfall compared to ambient. But once you got to 3.3 Celsius warming, the richness actually declined when you added reduced rainfall in addition to the warming. And Pinus banksiana, I kind of saw the opposite where, um, in the ambient and 1.7 degrees Celsius treatments, you saw higher richness when there was ambient rainfall and lower richness when there was reduced rainfall. And you didn't really see much of a difference when there was 3.3 degrees Celsius of warming. Um, so that is all for that I saw for alpha diversity. And then I started to take a look at the beta diversities, first starting with whether or not the relative abundance of ascomycete fungi increased as observed in previous studies. And I actually didn't find any significant differences uh, in the relative abundance of ascomycete fungi across the different treatments. As you can see, it was highly variable by these very large standard error bars. There were no significant differences uh, across the treatments, which was pretty interesting because it diverged from some other previous findings. Uh, but there were significant effects of tree host species, temperature, rainfall, as well as the com combined effect of temperature and rainfall on ectomycorrhizal fungal community composition. So this is just a, an NMDS plot, a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot. That is basically a visual representation of the dissimilarities of the fungal communities across these six treatments and two hosts. So you can see that, especially for Pinus banksiana, these centroids, so the circles that are filled and not filled, uh, the centroids are pretty far apart. Uh, and you can see that basically there were significant effects of the treatment on the fungal community's composition. But then I asked, um, well, I know that they're different and I know that there are significant effects of these treatments, but how exactly are they different? So I wanted to take a look at the effects of the treatments on specific ectomycorrhizal fungal lineages. So I looked through my data for the top five most uh, abundant lineages. Everything here occurred um, in my data set was 10% or higher relative abundance from my full data set. Uh, so the five lineages were Tomentella telephora, Sebacina, Russella lactarius, Anosibi, and Amphenema tylospora. So the first really interesting thing that I saw was that, and which is consistent with uh, previous research studies, was that the Tomentella telephora lineage decreased in relative abundance with increasing stress. So overall, it was low, it had lower relative abundance in these warmer, drier treatments. And to emphasize that, I actually went back and took a look at the individual plot level soil moisture data. And you can see um, on the right, so this is the relative abundance of the Tomatella telephora lineage per uh, average across the, the two uh, host species. So samples are average across the pinba and the pinst. And you can see that uh, when soil moisture is higher, Generally, Tomentella telephora has higher relative abundance, and when it's lower, it's less prevalent. Uh, the second very interesting lineage was the Russell lactarius lineage, and this one primarily, regardless of the temperature treatment, was very sensitive to the reduced rainfall. 
So at all temperatures, um, on average, uh, the relative abundance was lower at reduced rain. And you can see um, that when everything is averaged across temperature and across the two hosts, there's quite a difference in the mean relative abundance of the Russella lactarius lineage compared to the re much smaller relative abundance at reduced rain. Uh, the last one that I'll highlight that was uh, pretty cool going in the opposite direction was that this anosophy lineage actually became more prevalent in warmer and drier conditions. Uh, and so I took a look at how the relative abundance of anosophy, uh, anosophy um, changed with the soil moisture of the plots. And you can see that it's pretty much going in the opposite direction as what we saw for Tomentella telephora where the relative abundance is uh, declining with increasing plot soil moisture. So to summarize the findings from this project, um, so for alpha diversity, I observed ectomycorrhizal fungal OT richness generally declined with combined warming and reduced rainfall, though the response really did vary by tree host which was interesting uh, and sort of contradicted a different study at before warmed. Uh, with respect to beta diversity, ectomycorrhizal fungal lineages responded differently to varying temperature and rainfall treatments. So some responded more strongly to rainfall, uh, some to warming and some to the combined warming and rainfall stress. And as we saw from just the couple that I highlighted that were most abundant. Uh, and I actually did not see any significant uh, increases in the relative abundance of ascomycete fungi with warming and reduced rainfall or with their combination. So um, that's everything that I have for this first part. Um, I could pretty quickly uh, go over another really cool ongoing project that I'm currently doing uh, on a different sort of different aspect of ectomycorrhizal fungi. Um, so, uh, I showed this figure earlier and what I find really interesting is how we're still learning a lot about how warming and drying affect soil fungal community structure, but also, um, surprisingly, uh, we don't know a ton about how warming and reduced rainfall are affecting their productivity. So how much fungal mycelium are they producing? And also the phenology of soil fungal activity, um, which I thought was really fascinating. Uh, and so that really motivated this second question that I've been investigating for the second chapter of my dissertation at Be Formed as well. So how do warming and reduced rainfall affect one below ground production of ectomycorrhizal fungal mycelium, as well as tree fine roots since these two are related. And then also how does it affect the phenology, uh, so the seasonal timing of ectomycorrhizal fungal mycelium production. So for my methods, unlike root tips, which I was really easily able to just collect and identify, uh, estimating the amount of extra matrical mycelium production is a bit more challenging. So one tool that is used to estimate uh, a mycelial biomass is mesh in growth bags that are filled with carbon-free sand, and they look kind of like this. Um, and the idea is that this method is intended to select against saprotrophic fungi that need a carbon source, thus it, they enrich the sandbag community, so the inside of the sandbag, with ectomycorrhizal fungi. Um, and you basically harvest these and sequence what's inside. So last uh, spring to October, I conducted a field experiment where I deployed these cool root cages that I built um, with the interns at Before Warmed, and they are were just filled with soil from the site, and basically I just let roots grow into those, and then to capture the ectomycorrhizal mycelium, I deployed at three different time periods these sandbags that I just described that are 50 micron mesh. And they were buried just near the surface of the soil, so just five centimeters deep, and they were harvested at two month intervals. And I'm currently in the process of um, doing um, DNA extractions, and uh, they will be sent for alumina myceque high throughput sequencing, and I'll also be using quantitative PCR to basically estimate fungal biomass that's inside the sandbags. And so that's what I'm currently working on.
Um, and so I'll kind of, I know we're a little bit over time, so I'll sort of skip over some of this, but in general, um, anticipating that uh, below ground production, both fine root and uh, mycelial production will be um, all basically altered by these warming and drying treatments. So I'm expecting in this uh, warming only treatment with ambient rainfall, uh, an increase in fine root uh, biomass production because that has actually been pretty much seen across the board in warming treatments uh, for fine roots. Um, I'm anticipating actually a decline in mycelial production, mostly uh, related to the fact that studies have seen um, that warming may result in an increase in mycorrhizal, ectomycorrhizal fungi that are these contact type rather than um, ectomycorrhizal fungi that produce really long ranging um, extramatricle mycelium. So I would anticipate because we're seeing these shifts in the function of the communities with warming in previous studies that we would see less extramatricle mycelium. The ambient reduced rainfall treatment um, testing, uh, I don't anticipate as much of a difference in fine root biomass, and I am testing the idea that potentially we could see an increase in, my, in ectomycorrhizal mycelial production that sort of quote unquote offsets uh, fine roots, which is a pretty polemic, but I'm very curious to see if that's something that we see. Um, and then I anticipate a pretty significant decline in both fine root and mycelial biomass in the combined warming and reduced rainfall treatment, just given the, um, the effect of the stressor on both the fungus and the tree hosts in the plot. And then lastly, I'm anticipating basically that this phenological uh, effect of warming on trees that we would see something like this below ground as well, where I, I'm anticipating higher spring mycelium production relative to um, ambient in these warmed plots. Just because the soil is warmer and, for example, def it will defrost much faster. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, and yeah, just kind of, this is just a summary of this project. Uh, it'll provide insight into the effects of environmental stress on the production of both fine roots and ectomicros mycelium, which has a lot of implications for soil carbon cycling. And also it will just increase what we know about how climate change can Im impact temporal patterns of high flow activity below ground, uh, which is cool because it's really hard to see. Uh, and then this is just what the actual root cores ended up looking like in the ground. Um, and those were harvested. And with that, I'd just like to thank my funding sources um, and my advisors, Peter and Peter, and my committee, the Before Worm team that has just been amazing, and all of my awesome Kennedy Lab members who have been very supportive and helping in the field and also with stats and just snacks as well. <laughs> um, so I'll stop sharing and hopefully take some questions. So thank you so much. Wow. Really fascinating. Um, actually, I am has a question and um, I am, do you just want to uh, unmute and ask it? Sure. Yeah. You mentioned um, when you were talking about your second project that I think if I understood correctly, you would be using the copy count number. Yeah. yeah. Are you planning to at all quantify the ergosterol mass to see how much fungal biomass you have? Um, yeah, um, I won't be only because the yield in these plots is actually so very low. Um, yeah, I've been experimenting with like the craziest ways to pellet the hyphae from the sand and the yield is just so low that sadly for this project, I won't be. But hopefully for my next project, we'll all be doing something similar using like mesocosms. Um, there's a question in the chat from Jail. Um, how long did you say the bags will be underground before you harvest them? Yeah, so they were uh, each like cohort for the seasonality component were in there for about like six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those have all been harvested and have been in the process of doing the molecular work. 
um, I have, it's maybe a, a social question, but it's sort of, um, it seems like there's so many different studies going on and that based on what you see that other people have um, kind of found that you have these anticipated outcomes. And then when you find something out that is unanticipated, mm -hmm. does it change how other people are thinking of their, of what they want to study? It's like, oh my gosh, she just found this. It's totally unexpected. And then they yeah. kind of have different anticipations for their outcomes based on um, your findings. Yeah. Yeah. Something that I've been talking with my advisors a lot about is just like the need for repeated global change studies. And so I'm actually currently working on a manuscript uh, comparing like two different cohorts of the same species at B4 worm to see basically, do we see the same results over two cohorts? So I'll have more insight about that soon. But yeah, I think, yeah, it's definitely really tricky. Um, but I think it's important to know whether, because this is even just in the same experiment, finding different, like slightly different results, which could be a lot of things like different years, different seedlings. But um, yeah, I'm very, very intrigued by, yeah, just re figuring out how we can repeat experiments in a way that is useful and informative. Interesting. Yeah, it seems like, um, I mean, even just the process, first off, of being in graduate school and focusing on your um, experiments, it would be impossible to keep up on other people's experiments. At the same time, it's like kind of yeah. like the cross nation and, you know, learning from one another. But even like you said, comparing um, results and seeing how how much the same they are, how, how different they are is, is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions from the, the MMS members? Let's see, um, Steve, any positive or negative effect from subsurface frost depth over your experiment? Does a freeze zone affect the presence of seasonal mycelium in general? Um, and does the, the frost cycle relate or recharge a water deficiency in nature? Hmm. That's a, yeah, that's a good question. So, the for the for this experiment i pretty much started everything once the soil was pretty much not frozen mostly because it was really hard uh because these soils are like they're not super clayey but they're like oh, i think like 12 percent clay which is like enough to, that they get really compact so i yeah I, I didn't really run into like the soil actually being frozen one really, I don't uh, think I said this, but like unique aspect of before warmed is that it's only warmed over the growing season. And the growing season is generally April to November. So the only time that there's like a time where the control plots are kind of frozen and then the experimental ones are not would be like April to, to May ish. Um, but yeah, I haven't really, we probably should do some interesting snow and frost work but yeah I haven't really thought about it <clears throat> I was interested when you talked about how um and I'm going to forget the name for it but where there's um fewer species but larger clusters of those species mm -hmm. what was that called again oh um, yeah so this is from a study uh, a penna 2017 study where they saw phylogenetic clustering yeah. um yeah, and that's something that I would hope to do on this data set at some point um, and haven't had the opportunity to do. I'd be curious to see, yeah, if I see that aspect in this data set, in addition to the effects on just like taxonomic diversity overall. When you say phylogenic clustering, can you mm -hmm. explain more what that what that really means? Yeah, it literally just like you, I mean, I, I, this is not my specialty, but in a nutshell, from my understanding is you calculate basically different indices that tell you like how related is this one taxon to the next one, to the next one in your data set. And you just calculate these indices that tell you how related um, things are and your basically in your data set based off of um, like a large like oh your OTU table and you like create a phylogenetic tree um which I haven't done yet for my data I don't have a phylogenetic tree for it but yeah basically the idea is that if you see 
that the species in your data set are like more closely related than you might anticipate from a larger like regional species pool, then that would be considered phylogenetic clustering. Whereas the opposite would be phylogenetic over dispersion where it's like, oh, things mm -hmm. you'd expect things to be more related, but they're actually less related than you saw. So very cool. All right. Any other questions? Gosh, well, thank you both so much. This is really, really fascinating. And it's I appreciate you. Um, presenting to us over Zoom and um, answering our questions.